Let's bow our heads for prayer. Jesus, tonight we are grateful that your Holy Spirit has been promised and we're counting on your Spirit to teach us from your word uh, important truths. Tonight, Lord, especially as we look at how we can face the end time with confidence uh, and assurance, would you give us a clear understanding of your grace, we pray in your name. Amen. The greatest key to Bible prophecy is actually understanding the gospel. Jesus, I believe, is coming soon. Last night, Daniel 2 showed us that starting about 600 years before Christ, Babylon would be followed by the silver of Medo-Persia, the bronze of Greece, the uh, iron of Rome, and then the division. And that that divided Roman world, which is still the case to this day, would last until the stone comes cut out without hands that would be God's eternal kingdom set up. So on God's scenario, this is a very simple picture. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, division, the kingdom of God. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, division. We still live in the times of the divided Roman Empire. And the next big item on God's timeline is his return. And so I asked the question last night, closed with it, how can we face that end with confidence? Or we don't have to wait till Jesus comes. Any one of us could breathe our last tonight, right? And uh, could we face our own death with confidence? You know, the only way to really live well is if you're ready to die well. Isn't that right? And so tonight we want to specifically look at how we can face the end of time or even just the end of our lives with confidence. I want to start by asking a question. <clears throat> Think about this. Have I come to the place in my spiritual experience with God where I know for certain right now that I have eternal life? Is that a fair question? Put another way. If you were to face death right now with no opportunity for any last-minute confession or any final good works, how you are is how you are. Could you face death right now with quiet assurance knowing that you will be spending your eternity with Jesus? If Jesus were to come right now and the roof were to split wide open and there he is, the second coming is in progress, can we look up with humble confidence and say, this is my God, I have waited for him, he will save me? Do we know? Interestingly enough, anything but a solid yes is a no. If you say maybe, you're not sure. If you say, I hope so, nah, you're not certain. The Bible says that we can be certain. We're going to look mainly at this verse tonight and then a few others around it. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I want to begin this evening by just noticing that closing phrase of that passage that you may know that you have eternal life. I believe God intends us to live not with insecurity or uncertainty but with assurance and confidence about our future. Not that we're worthy, not that we're perfect, but he says we can know we have eternal life. If your entrance into heaven depended on having the right answer, would you have the right answer tonight? We're going to spend some time in this verse, starting in verse 11. And this is the testimony. Where do we use the word testimony in our world today? Court and church, right? Some churches, I want to testify to Jesus tonight, right? Or you go to court and you're asked to come to the witness stand and will you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And this word testimony is simply the same Greek word used to be translated witness. This is the witness. Now, in order to be a witness in court, what has to be your relationship to what you're talking about? It has to be first person. You can't go to court and say, well, my brother John told me that my Aunt Ruth saw such and such happen. They're going to say, hearsay, you're not a witness. The only way you can be a witness is to have seen it personally. 
So John, if you go back later tonight and read the first two or three chapters, or the first two or three verses of this little letter called 1 John, it's just about three or four pages in front of the book of Revelation, right at the end of the New Testament. John says, I was with Jesus. I saw him, I touched him, I walked with him, we spent time together. I am a first-hand witness concerning Jesus. And now near the end of his letter, he says, this is the witness. Let me tell you the first-hand knowledge of what I have of Jesus Christ. Just the facts. This is the witness that God has given us eternal life. Now, when I say the words eternal life, what comes to your mind? I think somebody said heaven. Is eternal life just waking up tomorrow forever? How old did Adam live? Genesis chapter 5, I think. 930 years. If I could tell you tonight, I can guarantee you will live to be 930. Would that be good news? You see, when I say it that way, you're thinking this earth. You can't retire until you're 865. Oh, my sakes, I'm getting tired already. If you were Adam and you were nearing your death, you would have been born around the year 1100. Can you imagine living through everything you've read and heard has happened between now and 1100? It would wear you out, right? So when we think about eternal life, we automatically add quality to quantity. It's not just waking up tomorrow forever. It's got to be in a better place or it's not good news. Eternal life has to be life forever in a place worth living in forever, which is not this sinful world. If eternal life is good news, it has to be both quality and quantity. So we put heaven in there, a better place. And indeed, that's what scripture talks about when it talks about eternal life. Here are the facts that God has given us eternal life. Now notice it says in that first verse that God has given eternal life. Is that future, present, or past? Past. You could add the word already. God has already given us eternal life. You mean we don't have to wait for the second coming to start experiencing eternal life? If God has already given it, first of all, it is a gift. He gives it, right? Secondly, you can evidently have it now because he's already given it. The only way I kind of know to explain that is, suppose I were to say to you, I've given you $1,000. You'd say, well, where is it? And I'd say, well, I put it in an, account in, uh, in an account in your name down at the bank. Now, can I put money in your account? Yeah. Can I take it back out if I want to? No. So if I put money in your account, I have given it. You could die in poverty because you never went down to the bank to draw it out. But I have still given it. 2,000 years ago, Jesus did everything necessary for you and I to have eternal life. He put eternal life, I believe, in the bank for every single person. But have you ever been given a gift you didn't want? I think we've all had that experience, haven't we? Oh, look at, why, thank you, you know, what am I going to do with this? God gives everybody the gift, but love, love provides for all, but love doesn't force you to take it. He put eternal life in the bank for every one of us. And the bank is only a prayer away, but he won't make us receive it. See, one of the amazing things is there's not one single sin between any person and God tonight. Because they were all born in his body on the cross. The only thing that's between you and I and God is our perception of him and whether or not we want what he's already done. We don't need to change his mind. He's trying to change our mind. He's already given us eternal life. It's available now. So, according to this verse, 1 John 5, 11 to 13, God is a gift for you. It's called eternal life. And it comes in the Son. 
It comes in the Son. Who is the Son? Jesus. Jesus is a person. I want you to notice this. Eternal life comes packaged in a person. It, it doesn't come packaged in a church. You're not going to find eternal life by belonging to the right church. I think belonging to the right church is great. It's a family that helps you walk with Jesus. But eternal life is not found in a church. It's not found in a lifestyle. It's not found in being good enough. It's not found in confessing hard enough. It's found in a person. Packaged in a person. Now notice verse 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. John writes in very black and white terms. He says, uh, if you got Jesus, you got life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. It's a simple black and white equation. So you get eternal life by getting a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Now, notice it says, if you have the Son. That word have is interesting because you see, I have a car. And I have a wife. Do I mean the same thing by have in both cases? I have the car by ownership. Don't laugh, it's paid for, right? Do I have my wife by ownership? She'll be very quick to tell you no. How do I have my wife? We're not allowed to own people, that's slavery. How do you have a person? I would like to suggest it's not by ownership, it's by relationship. So as I pull this together, here are the facts that God has already given us eternal life. Eternal life comes packaged in a person. Therefore, I could say in verse 12, the one who has a relationship with the Son of God has life. The one who does not have a relationship with the Son of God does not have life. Are you with me? It's about a relationship. Um, the third verse that we're looking at, verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. The word believe in the Greek language of the New Testament, uh, there's just one word which is translated all through the New Testament either as belief, faith, or trust. So you can pick your synonym in the English. You can translate this, I've written this to you who trust in the name of the Son of God, those of you who have faith in the name of the Son of God, or if you believe in the same name of the Son of God. So I'm going to use the word trust. Now let me ask you a question. What is the deepest foundational basis of a relationship? Is it love or is it trust? How many of you have people in your life that you love dearly? but you can't have a very deep relationship with them because you can't trust them. Does that make sense? So this all fits together now. The way you have eternal life is through a relationship with the Son, how you have the Son. And now I've written this to you who believe trust is the basis of relationship. If you have a trust relationship in the name of the Son of God, all that the names of Jesus connote, he says, I write this to you that you may know that you have eternal life. If you were to ask me tonight, uh, Pastor Gary, are you married? And I were to say, I think so. You would think something was wrong, right? It's knowable. You can know whether you have a husband or a wife, a spouse. And by the way, it's not just a piece of paper. It's not that you said I do in front of a crowd. It's a relationship, right? You can know you are in a relationship, therefore you know you have a marriage. You can know you're in relationship with Jesus, therefore you can know you have eternal life. Does that make sense? Here's one of the neat things about marriage. 37 years ago in about six months, my wife and I stood in front of her father who was a preacher and he said do you and we said we do and we went in one split second from being completely unmarried to being completely married isn't that right and 37 and a half years later we're not any more married than we were the moment we got married but what about the relationship 
Oh, that has morphed and changed and grown, right? But the relationship has grown within the security of the marriage. The relationship hasn't grown in order that hopefully someday we'll have a marriage. Do you follow me? In the same way, I believe the Bible is clear. The moment we say yes to Jesus Christ and receive what he has done for us, he says, you have eternal life. You are mine. You are secure in me. Does the relationship continue to grow and change? Yes, the relationship will grow and change over the years with God. But that relationship that changes us happens inside the security of knowing we're saved. Not, hopefully we'll be good enough someday to have salvation. God's favorite illustration of his relationship with us is marriage, and it fits perfectly. So, we can see that this verse says that God is a gift for us. That gift is called eternal life. It comes packaged in the person of Jesus Christ. And when we're in a relationship with him, we can know we have eternal life. Are you with me so far? Okay. Let's go to another verse. We'll use mostly the screen tonight. Um, you can follow the verses up there. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that uh, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Notice what this verse says. First of all, it says God has a gift for you. Whatever this is, it's a gift of God. Amen? That gift here is called grace. You get this gift of grace through faith, and when through faith you have grace, you are saved. Okay? So notice how they parallel in content. If you were drowning in a lake and I pulled you out, would you know you'd been saved? Yes, being saved is a knowable thing. This says if you're trusting through trust or faith, you receive the gift of grace that makes you saved. I'd like to suggest, one of my favorite illustrations here, is that grace is kind of like a bus. If you ride the bus, you spend a lot of time at the bus stop, right? But as you are sitting at the bus stop, and you're, I, I, it's fun watching people when I'm driving, they're walking out into the road, looking down the street, trying to see if the bus is coming, right? So you're out there looking, where's the bus, and you see the bus coming. Now, let me ask you, do you own the bus? No. Did you build the bus? No. Do you maintain the bus? Do you fuel the bus? Do you drive the bus? No. Do you decide where the bus is going? No. In fact, if you didn't even exist, the bus would do what the bus is doing, right? So the bus is somebody, something that somebody else built, maintains, fuels, drives, and decides where it's going to go. The only connection you have the bus is when the bus comes by and opens the door if you decide to get on the bus. And in the same way, grace is something that God has built that will take us from death into life. And it's going to do what it's going to do whether we get involved or not. The only question is, will we get on board when it comes by? And if you get on board the bus, you can't help but end up where the bus is going. So tonight I want to talk about grace. That bus that God has built that if we're willing to get on board it's already been built folks it's going to eternal life and it'll take anybody there who gets on board the question isn't whether the bus is any good the question is whether we'll trust the bus and get on board so we're going to talk about grace a third verse Romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice these three verses all say the same thing. God has a gift for you. It's called grace or eternal life, and it comes through putting your faith or trust in Jesus, the Son of God. All right? Now, how free does a gift have to be to be a gift? It's kind of a dumb question, isn't it? If I bought my wife a dozen roses, I said, 
Dear, I brought you these roses because I want you to know how much I love you. She would be delighted and I'd be broke, right? When is the last time you bought a dozen roses? Okay. So then I say to her later in the evening, you know, dear, I had to spend some of next week's food budget money in order to buy you these roses. Could you work a little overtime next week? Are those roses a gift? Not anymore. If I uh, bought my wife a new car, all she has to do is get a job and make the payments. Would that be a gift? No. If I had a new car and I said to you, I will give it to you for $50, would that be a gift? Almost. But if you didn't have 50 bucks, you couldn't have it, right? We call that a bargain. I use those illustrations just to make the point that we know that salvation is not something we can earn. It's not a wage. It's not something that somebody put a down payment on and we have to make the installments, no matter how big that down payment is. That wouldn't be a gift. Um, it's not something where we pay a little and get a lot. That would be a bargain. Whatever salvation is, it has to be totally free to us. It costs somebody else the full price, but it has to be totally free to us, before, during, and after. All right? Now let's go back to that verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. There is something we can earn. What is that? Unfortunately, that's death. There's a wage. That's something you earn as opposed to a gift you can't earn. If you earn a gift, it's turned into a wage and it's not a gift anymore. There is a wage we can earn. It's called death and it comes through sin. So how many of us have earned the wage? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come up short of the glory of God. This verse always makes me think of my first trip to Disneyland. I am the same age as Disneyland. Disneyland opened in May of 1955, and I opened in November, okay? But when I was eight years old, we went to Disneyland. And we went into the park, and we went back to where it's a small world is. It was, a small world wasn't always there. da 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 You know, that, that song goes through your mind forever. Um, it wasn't there. We went back and we turned right and there were these submarines that the old submarines are in a different place now and we got in those and that was pretty cool for an eight-year-old as you're down under the water looking out a window even though everything's fake it, it still was pretty exciting and then we went on over to the right to the Tomorrowland Autopia where you had little cars with a real steering wheel a real brake pedal a real gas pedal on a real little road with overpasses and underpasses, well, there was a ridge down the middle so you couldn't drive off the road, but you were actually driving a car. Pretty cool for a kid. My sister and I, she's two years older than me, we got in line and we're about to go through the turnstile. And I look over to my left and there's this sign and there's a line on it and it says, if you're this tall, you can go on this ride. And I knew I was toast. My sister, being two years old, two years older, was enough taller. She got to go on the ride, and she drove that little car around waving and shouting and having a wonderful time, and I needed counseling. <laughs> because I had to get on this little ride that had a little plastic car thingy on the end of an arm that went around in a circle for the little kids. I always think of that. I was too short, and there wasn't a thing I could do about it, right? Something about sin has made us all too short to be eligible to go on the heavenly ride. It'll never be because of us. We've sinned and we've come up short. What is sin? There are several definitions of scripture, but let's look at this one. 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. If you're used to the old King James Version, it says sin is transgression of the law. But in the Greek, it's just one little word. It's the word for law, nomos, and a little letter A in front of it, which in the Greek means un. Sin is unlaw. Okay, let's talk about that. Um, if you come to one of these eight-sided red signs, what are you supposed to do? Stop. 
How often are you supposed to stop at a stop sign? Every time. How much of a stop? All the way. So let's say I'm, in a, I'm driving home this evening and I have to go through a couple of different stop signs and it's late at night and there's nobody around and I do the slow and go. I don't notice the policeman sitting in the dark over there so he pulls me over and when he comes to the window as I hand him my license and insurance card, I say, officer, I have good news for you tonight. You are not going to need to give me a ticket. Really? Yes. Why? Because I'm perfect. Go back to your little computer and put in my number, license number. You will discover I have no tickets, no accidents. I'm perfect. What's he going to say? You were perfect until a minute ago. Oh, but I say, officer, listen, I have, I've lived here 19 and a half years. I've gone through this stop sign literally hundreds of times, and I've always stopped every time. Isn't that good enough? And he's going to say, no, your past stopping has nothing to do with the fact that you just ran it. And I say, well, listen, officer, let me back up and stop. And he'll say, but that's next time. Have you discovered you can never unsay a word or undo a deed? The point I'm making with this little illustration is that law is very simple. It simply demands perfect obedience. Right? Stop every time all the way and you're fine. But you don't ever build up any good karma, so to speak, you know. If, if you ever don't stop all the way one time, you have become a full breaker of the law. Oh, but you say... Officer, I'm sorry. I promise I'll never do it again. And he's going to say that's good, but you'll still have to pay the penalty even if you're sorry. Isn't that right? If I went out and got a gun and shot somebody and killed them, and my plea in court is this, Judge, I am 99% righteous. I only kill people 1% of the time. I'm overwhelmingly good. Is that going to work? No, because law demands perfect obedience or a penalty if it's ever broken at all. I love this picture. It's back from the 1930s or so of guys having their lunch on a uh, I-beam on a skyscraper high above Manhattan. If you were to go up to the top of a tall building and you look over the side and you say, all my life I have kept the law of gravity faithfully. Never broken the law of gravity. I think today I'll just step off one inch for one second and step right back. What's going to happen? You're going to discover that the law of gravity demands perfect obedience or a penalty if it's ever broken, right? And by the way, you can yell I'm sorry all the way down and you'll hit just as hard. So the point here is, the law is very simple. It demands perfect obedience or a penalty. And it's the same way with God's laws, but now I want you to listen very carefully. I believe that God's laws, according to the scripture, are simply the laws of life. They simply explain how life works. Now, what happens if you step out of how life works? Where have you stepped into? where life doesn't work, right? If you step out of where life works into where life doesn't work, that results in unlife or death, okay? You see, the Bible says the wage of sin is death. It doesn't say the penalty of God against sinners is death. It's a very subtle difference, and sometimes I hear that wage of sin is death uh, talked about, well, you know, God has a punishment against sin, and it is death. It doesn't say God kills sinners. What that verse says is sin is killing you. I want to introduce two words, intrinsic and imposed. If you run a stop sign, and the judge says, $200 fine. Is that intrinsic or imposed? What does the word intrinsic mean? 
the natural inevitable result imposed something artificially put on you. So when the judge says, because you ran the stop sign, there's a $200 fine you'll have to pay, that is imposed. But if you step off the tall building and smash at the bottom, no judge has to sentence you to die at the bottom of the building because you broke the law of gravity. The sentence is intrinsic. Are you with me? I think this is absolutely vital because we have this idea that God is up there looking down and he sees every deed and he hears every word and he knows every thought and he catches us sinning. Well, he's going to have to kill us. The Bible doesn't say God kills sinners. The Bible says sin is killing us. God didn't send Jesus to save us from what he's going to do to us because we sinned. Jesus is God come to save us from what sin is doing to us. Do you follow that? God is not in the condemning business. Sin does that all by itself. God is in the saving business from what's happened to us and what we've participated in. I believe that the wage of sin is death says that the intrinsic result of sin is death. What is God up to? Well, the bad news of the Bible is We've all sinned, and the wage is death. Um, by the way, if, if um, let's see, if I committed mass murder and you stole a candy bar, and we stood in front of the judge, and the judge looked at me and said, uh, uh, sentence me to $100 and sentence you to death, what would you say? That's not fair. He's the one that committed murder, okay? We've, we've all sinned. And in this case, the, the wage of sin is that God isn't sentencing us because we sin. Sin intrinsically is stepping outside the laws of life. And when you step outside the laws of life, you're in death. What the good news is that God has built the bus called grace to take us from death back into life. Remember, God is not in the condemning business. He's in the saving business. And that's called grace. Let me try to illustrate all this with a diagram. This line represents your life. On the left-hand end is your birth, the right-hand end is your death, and somewhere in the middle is the point at which you accept Christ, also known as the new birth. Now, from the time you accept Christ back to your birth, is it fair to say that your past life has been full of sin? What did it say? All have sinned, and the wage of sin is death. By the way, 1 John 1, about verse 8 or 10, says, if you claim you haven't sinned, you make God a liar, so you just did, right? Okay. So we've all sinned. We have a problem. We're sinking in sin and death. The inevitable is going to happen to us. None of us are going to get out of here alive. We have a problem. We need a solution. Let's find the solution. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does it mean to confess? If you ran the stop sign and the judge says, how do you plead? If you confess, what are you going to plead? Guilty. So if you did it, you plead guilty. That's confession. It's admitting what you did. So this verse says that if you will admit to your sins, God says... He will forgive you and expunge your record, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Let's try that in a human courtroom for illustration. So let's say that um, I ran the stop sign, and I'm in court, and we're all there waiting. We all ran the stop sign, you know, and we have to be there at 8 o'clock at the, at the courtroom, and they call us up one by one. But as we're sitting there in the courtroom, we notice that over the judge's bench is a big banner. It says, Today's Special. Plead guilty, go free. Okay. Now, you know good and well in the American system, it's deny, 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 and look for a loophole. But with that banner up there, it says, plead guilty, go free. He calls my name. The, 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 the judge calls my name. I come forward. He says, here's the charges against you. You ran the stop sign. How do you plead? I have to decide whether or not I trust the judge. So I decide I'm going to trust the judge. Plead guilty, go free. I say, I'm... I'm guilty, Your Honor. I plead guilty. And he lowers the gavel and he says, case dismissed, you're free to go. What do, 
what, what do I think of the judge? This is my lucky day, right? And so I sit down because I want to see what's going to happen to some of the rest of you. And you're called up and you look at the banner and you plead guilty and he says, case dismissed, record expunged, you're free to go. And what do we all think of the judge? This is the greatest guy on earth, right? We love the judge. Until one man is called forward and instead of the infraction being running a stop sign at 2 in the morning or something, this man is charged with rape and murder. And he looks at the judge and he says, I plead guilty, Your Honor. And the judge says, Case dismissed, record expunged, you're free to go. Now what do we think of the judge? Our whole attitude toward this judge just completely shifted, right? I mean, I'm not that bad. I'm glad he let me off, right? But if you let that guy off, our streets are not safe for ourselves and our families, right? All of a sudden, we want to say, Judge, would you tear down the stupid banner, please? I would like to pay the maximum fine for running the stop sign because I want this guy to pay the maximum for what he's done. I want him in jail so my wife and kids and family are safe. You see, that illustration <clears throat> helps us understand that a judge who lets people off because he's nice is not really very nice. He is unleashing lawlessness on our streets and our society. We don't want that kind of a judge. And yet this verse kind of sounds like God is that kind of a judge. He says, if you'll just say you're sorry, if you'll just say I did it, I'll let you go. Well, let's look a little more carefully at this verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us. What does faithful mean? If I'm faithful to my wife, except I just go out on her once a year, am I faithful? No, I'm not faithful. Faithful is a guarantee, 100%, right? So, <clears throat> this verse says, if you plead guilty, he guarantees you're going to go free. Still sounds like the nice guy judge, so let's keep reading. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. What does just mean? It's part of the word justice. You go to the court of justice, you stand before a court justice or a justice of the peace, and he is supposed to... Boy, that word just totally slipped my mind. He's supposed to render justice, right? Again. If I committed mass murder and you stole the candy bar and I got a hundred dollar fine and you got the, the uh, uh, death penalty, you'd say that's not just. That's not what the law says. Remember the uh, statue of Lady Justice? She's got a blindfold. Why? Because it's not supposed to matter whether you're rich or poor, white or black, male or female, tall or short, educated or uneducated, or have a lot of money or none. It is just weighing out against the law what you did. Justice is supposed to be blind. Justice means to do what is fair according to what? The law. To make sure the law is applied fairly in all cases. So when it says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, what does that tell us? Was the nice guy judge letting everybody go just because he felt nice that day? Was he being just? No, he was shredding the law, not applying the law fairly. To be just means to do what is legally correct or right. So notice, God is not the nice guy judge. It's not you plead guilty and he'll just let you go because he's feeling good about you today. It actually says when he lets you go, he is keeping the law perfectly. Oh. So then the question is, what gives God the right to let you go for all your sins? What gives him the right to set you free from the penalty and presence of all your sins? Well, you say he's God. He can do whatever he wants to. Yeah, I guess he could. 
But if he just lets you go because he feels like it, he's unleashing lawlessness in the universe. And what is lawlessness? Lawlessness is sin. Do you want to be saved into a universe where sin is institutionalized? Or do you want to be saved into a universe where sin is banished? So this says that when Jesus lets you go, he does it lawfully. So let's try to understand this. Let's go back to the courtroom once more. You are standing in front of the judge. He's about to fine you the maximum fine for running stop signs. And I burst in the back door and I say, Your Honor, I set the defendant free. What's the judge going to say to me? Who are you? And you have no standing in my courtroom. I say, Oh, but I'm, I'm her friend. Well, it's nice she has friends, but that doesn't matter here. Well, I'm her pastor. Well, glad she goes to church, but that doesn't matter here. I could be your dad. And I wouldn't have the right to set you free. Unless, unless I were able to produce a receipt for having paid the maximum fine for running stop signs. I wasn't guilty of running a stop sign, and I was willing to give it away. Can somebody else pay your fine? Yeah, parents, you've probably paid one or two for the kids, right? If I pay the fine, am not guilty, and am willing to give it away, can I set you free? Yes, but there's one little hitch between you and freedom. You have to plead guilty. If you stand there in front of the judge and say, but your honor, I didn't do it. I did not do it. I will not plead guilty. I can't help you. Because by accepting my payment, you're pleading guilty. Isn't that right? You see, confession is not you finally convincing God through your tears to somehow have mercy on you. He had mercy on you 2,000 years ago. Confession is just your power of choice to accept what he's offering. But if you don't confess, you're saying, I don't need what you're offering. So he says, if you'll just say, I need it, if you'll decide you need it, I've already given it. It's yours. The Bible says that Jesus committed no sin, but he bore our sins in his body on the cross. Body, that's physical. Not, not a spiritual metaphor. The God who can say rock and boom, a, a rock appears. He can say tree and a tree appears. He speaks and it is done. He evidently said sin over Jesus. And he gathered up every sin from the first sin of Adam and Eve to the last sin before Jesus comes. And he put them on Jesus and physically made Jesus to be our sin. What does it say? The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That includes you and me. Uh, God he, God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. When Jesus died on the cross, it took six hours. Normally, crucifixion took two to three, maybe four days for someone to die. It was horribly cruel. Jesus did not die of crucifixion. He died of my sins. He was tortured with crucifixion. That was Satan. But he died because of my sin. You see... He paid the maximum fine for sin, you might say. He was not guilty, and he says, I'm willing to give it to you. If you will just plead guilty and open your account, I've already paid. We don't need to change God's mind towards us. He's trying to get us to change our mind towards him. So Jesus' death on Calvary paid the maximum penalty for all sin. So that when we plead guilty, he says, you are forgiven. Your record is expunged. You stand as if you have never, ever sinned. Now, I want to I go to this verse one more time. I'm going to read this verse, and I'm going to skip a word, and I want you to tell me what word I skip. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What word did I leave out? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I skipped us. I have a quirky little belief that I want to drop in here. I don't believe God forgives sins. 
I believe God forgives sinners. He bore our sins in himself. No sin is overlooked. Every sin is fully dealt with, fully paid for. The law stands. Every sin receives its full consequence or penalty. And Jesus bore that for us so that he can forgive us. Forgiveness is not about a thing you do. Forgiveness is about you. He forgives us of our sins. So, at the moment I accept Jesus, how many of my sins are forgiven? What does it say? He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So all sin has been forgiven. If I were to die at that moment, am I ready for Jesus to come? Yeah? If I were to, uh, if Jesus were to come at that moment, is there any reason I would be ineligible for eternal life? No. Good news? Great news! Now all I have to do is live the rest of my life without sinning and I'm home free. Is that a problem? Now I bring that up for this reason. Most of the time when we hear the gospel explained, it's about Jesus died for me and all my sins have been washed away. Therefore, I have eternal life. Well, yeah, but what about from now until the end of my life? You see, I'm the weak link in the chain. How can I know I have eternal life when I'm not dead yet? So we need a solution for the future. We've seen the solution for the past. Let's find the solution for the future. 1 John 2, 1. Just two verses after 1 John 1, 9. Same context. My little children, these things I write to you in order that you might not sin. Now, I've given you a very literal translation there from the original Greek. My little children, I write these things to you in order that you might not sin. What does that say? Once, by the way, children, is it talking to small people? No, it's talking about to those who have been born again, right? At the new birth, at the cross. So once you've been forgiven at the cross and you're a new child of, of God in Jesus, he says, I write this to you in order that you might not sin. You don't ever have to sin again. Before you come to Jesus, sin is just what you do naturally. But when we come to Jesus, there's power. We don't have to live on that old level. We can grow up and live on a whole new level above sin. We don't have to sin anymore. Is that good news? And that is good news. But have you ever seen a baby learn to walk without falling down? Or drink its milk without spilling it? In the same way, what do you think are the chances you're going to make it from now till the end of your life without thinking one bad thought? You probably just did, right? The chances of a sin happening in your future is significant, right? So we have a problem. It is good news that the past no longer condemns me. It's good news that I'm not condemned to repeat the past. But what if I do fall in the ditch and sin? Okay, keep reading. And if anyone might sin. So it's saying, if you might in the future possibly sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Notice it's if you might, not when you have, but if you might, possibility, we have an advocate. What's an advocate? Interesting word. It's the word parakletos in the Greek. Para is for parallel. It's translated parallel. And kletos is a noun form of the verb to call. So literally, it's one called to be beside you. Okay? Jesus is the original parakletos, God with us. He came from heaven to earth to be beside us, one of us, and help us, right? But then he said to the disciples, I'm going back and you can't come along. So he said in John 14, 16, I will send another parakletos, and that's the Holy Spirit, who will not just be with you, but will be in you. So Jesus is the original God with us, the parakletos, and he is now, where is he? The advocate is with the Father. He's up in the courtroom where we need him now. And what are his credentials? He is Jesus Christ the righteous one. Now what's interesting is that word righteous is built on the same root as the word just over in chapter 1 verse 9. 
The one who had the legal right to cover my past sins because he bore the penalty for me has evidently the legal right to guarantee that even if I sin in the future, I'm still going to make it. Do you follow that? This verse doesn't tell me how he does it, but it tells me that he's done it. He has covered the if I might sin problem as well as having covered the all have sinned problem. So this tells me that in Jesus, sin is covered for me both past and future. Are you with me so far? How does he do it? And that brings us to a key verse, Romans 5 verse 10. Notice this verse, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now notice, this verse has two halves. The first half is in the past tense, when we were. The second half is in the future tense, we shall be. All right? So it says, if when we were, past tense, enemies. What made us enemies of God? I circled it up there for you in case you couldn't figure it out. Sin. Now, get this point. We're the ones throwing tomatoes at God. He's not throwing tomatoes at us. God, is, God never treats us as an enemy. We're his beloved sons and daughters. We're lost. We're a mess, but he loves us. He is never treating us with enmity. The, the enemy goes one way. We treat God like he's the enemy and tell him to get out of my life. I'm going to do it my way. That's what sin is. Telling God to go away and leave me alone. I'm going to do it myself. And he's saying, but I love you. I want to be in relationship with you. So when we were, past tense, sinners, enemies, acting as enemies towards God, while we were treating him like an enemy, we were, past tense, reconciled to God through the death of his son. What does it mean to be reconciled? Well, if you spread the word out there, it's to be reconciled. Now, to be conciled, there's no such word, but to be conciled is to be together, right? In relationship. So what happens if you have a fight with someone you're in relationship with? You get deconciled, all right? No such word, but you know what I'm talking about. You are on the outs, and there's all this garbage, this words and actions and stuff between you. So if you have this stuff between you, you're now deconciled. So what do you do to restore the relationship? You say, I'm sorry. Let's put those things away from between us so we can be reconciled. In this world, humanity started out consiled to God. At the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we got deconciled. We told God to go away and leave us alone. We do it our own way. And we're born lost, deconciled. But Jesus came and bore our sins in his body on the cross and took them out of the way and nailed them to the cross. Therefore, we can be reconciled with God. Are you with me? So the first half of this verse is review of what we've already seen. If when in the past we were enemies and we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, his death bore my sins and nailed them to the cross, there's no sin between me and God anymore. The only thing between me and God is my perceptions. He's already saved me whether I've accepted it or not. Okay, that's review. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. What are the next two words? Much more. What does much more mean? Even better than what was just said. If I told you I've given you a thousand dollars, then I said and much more, I've given you a dollar. Would that be much more? That would be much less. So what Paul is saying here is getting our past sins all taken care of through the death penalty paid by Jesus Christ, if that's good news, and we usually call that the gospel, if that's good news, it's only half of the gospel, and it's the small half. He says, much more, even better yet, what I'm about to tell you is even better news than that your sins have all been forgiven and done away with, and you've been reconciled to God. How could there be better news? Well, he says, much more, even better than having your past wiped clean in Jesus Christ, much more, 
having been reconciled. Now what that tells you is you have to accept part A before you can have part B. You have to accept the past part before you can have the future part. But once you've received the reconciliation that Jesus is offering and allowed him or accepted what he's already done to do away with all of your sins and come back into relationship with him, once you've been reconciled, now he says, we shall be saved by his life. That's interesting. We generally say Jesus died to save me. What Paul says in this verse is he died to reconcile me, but he lived to save me. Hmm. What kind of a life did Jesus live? We've already looked at the verses that say he never, ever sinned. He lived a life of 100% perfect obedience. That's what the first demand of the law is. Now I have a question for you. Why did Jesus come and live a life before he died on the cross? Why didn't he just come down one Friday and go back on Sunday and make a weekend out of it? It would have been a lot easier, right? Instead, he came and grew up and lived a life. And he faced sin and temptation and Satan and all the trouble of this world. But he never sinned. Why? Because the law demands... You know all the law demands for you to go to heaven and live forever? Be perfect. That's it. Very simple. Be perfect. The problem is... We've already sinned and we're less than perfect. So why did Jesus come and live? Some people say, well, to be an example. And he was a wonderful example. He showed us how to, how to pray and how to, how to relate with God very closely, how to walk a holy life. Yeah, yeah. Suppose the world's greatest pianist were to come up, and we got a nice grand piano under the cover over there, and were to sit down and play some Chopin, you know, some beautiful piano, difficult piano music for us right now. Is that a good example? Yeah, you, you heard somebody and saw somebody do it perfect. Now you go do it. Okay, I'll give you some time to practice. In reality, no matter how, you work, how hard you work at it, the fact that this pianist played it perfect doesn't mean you'll ever be able to play it perfect. I believe in Jesus as my example. I can learn so much by reading the Gospels and following his example. That is so helpful, but it doesn't guarantee I'm going to make it. And what this verse says is that Jesus' life guarantees I will end up saved. I'm going to make it because of his life. Here's what I believe. As his death was in my place, not an example, I hope. I don't want to go through that death. It was substitutionary. It was in my place. As he died in my place, so Paul is saying he also lived in my place. He lived the life required to be saved. Then he died bearing all of my sins. Then he rose from the grave conquering death. And when he went back to heaven, it's like he took his life and his death and he put them on account up there so that when I join my account to his remember the Bible says if you have the son you have life right God doesn't give us a credit card Jesus didn't die so he could hand us a credit card and say here every time you sin just swipe it'll be paid for no it says if you have the son you have life the only way to get this life is to marry Jesus. You know, if, if you had a million dollars the day you got married, and the one you married was a million dollars in debt, the minute you say, I do, you're both broke. Right? Called community property. Here's the cool thing. When we receive Jesus, it's like marrying him. We join in community property. He has on his account perfect righteousness and complete payment for all debt. What do I bring to the equation? Just a whole lot of debt. But when we join, what's left on our account? His payment sucks up all my debt and left on our joint account when I have the Son is perfect righteousness. Are you with me? 
This life is in His Son. The one who has the Son has life. Can you see how it is that if you have Jesus, you can't help but have life? If you are covered by all that Jesus is, there's no way in the universe you can be lost. Does that make sense? And that is what I believe the Bible calls grace. That's the bus. Let's put wheels on this thing. That's the bus that God built that if we will get on board, it can't help but take us from death back into life. He built the bus, he fuels the bus, he maintains the bus, he drives the bus, he decides where the bus is going. And if you get on that bus, you can't help but end up where the bus is going. And you have nothing to do with the bus except to trust the bus and get on board. So when we face such teachings as last night that says the very next big event in this world history is the coming of the Lord, this transition globally from the kingdoms of this world to the kingdom of God, when that stone is going to come and grind the kingdoms of this world to powder, we can know that if we are on that bus of grace, that stone will not fall and crush us, but we will ride it into eternity. God has shared with us how we can face the ultimate end of our life and of this world with a sense of assurance and joy. We don't deserve it, but we humbly and gratefully receive it and get on the bus. Question, are you on the bus? Tonight's presentation could have several could, could hit you in several different ways. Uh, there may be some of you here who would have to say, you know what, I'm not on that bus. I haven't heard, uh, I, I haven't understood this before, and I would like to receive Jesus as my Savior tonight. I'd like to get on the bus. Some of you may be saying, you know, I received Jesus a long time ago, but I didn't know it had all these benefits. I've met a lot of people, they've been following Jesus for decades, and they're still hoping to be saved. Someday, pray, uh, you know, the Lord willing, when he comes. But they don't have that quiet assurance that all is well. I hope tonight that whether you've already received Christ or are considering receiving him, you have seen that Jesus is all you need. And maybe understand a little bit more how forgiveness works and how you can look at your uncertain future with certainty because he's already done the living that will get you to heaven. Here's the cool thing. You see, the past no longer condemns you. He died. You're not condemned to repeat the past. He's living now to give you power. But the future can't knock you out because he's already done all the good living that will get you to heaven. The past no longer condemns you. He died. The future can't knock you out. He's already lived it. It's in the bank. Nothing can undo what Jesus has done. And he lives now to empower us to begin to experience that grace and joy and transformation. We don't grow up and live a better life in order to get saved or in order to stay saved. Actually, getting to live above the old life of sin is part of the gift that he gives us when he saves us. He takes our past and wipes it out. He takes our future and guarantees it. And then he says, now in the present, you get to start living eternal quality life right now. In the middle of a world of pain and sorrow and suffering and sin and addiction and all the garbage that happens in this world, you, by my power, can start living eternal quality right now because I can give you victory and transformation you no longer have to be conformed to this world you can be transformed through the renewing of your mind so your life can actually experience and prove what is that good 
and perfect and acceptable will of God. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. <clears throat> Jesus, we've done our best tonight to try to understand what Scripture says about salvation, about this incredible gift of grace that you have given us. You died, you lived, and you live now. There's nothing the law can demand. There's nothing in heaven and earth between us and complete salvation except our own stubbornness, our own doubt. Lord, I pray for each person here tonight that you will give us that glimmer of faith through understanding these things that we'll be able to look and say, yes, this is for me. It's already been done. What am I waiting for? With everyone's eyes closed, so everyone has the anonymity they deserve, I'd just like to ask, is there anyone here tonight who needs to tonight raise your hand and say, I want to get on the bus and go from lost to saved tonight in Jesus Christ? Is there anyone who's ready to say that tonight? You just see your hand. Yes, yes, yes. All right, yes. Now let me ask another question. Are there any of you here tonight who say, you know, I got on the bus a long time ago. I just didn't know the bus was this good. And I haven't understood, like I see tonight, that I can live my life with assurance rather than fear. With uh, security rather than insecurity. And that I can go through life in relationship with Jesus knowing that were I to die tonight or Jesus were to come tonight, I know where I'm ending up. I'm ending up in the kingdom of God forever. If you have just seen that tonight, even though you've already accepted Jesus and just want to raise your hand and say, Jesus, I'm claiming tonight the assurance of eternal life that you offer. Let me see your hands. Yes. All right. Thank you. Jesus, you see our hands. You know what each heart is saying. You know how this presentation has, has touched uh, each heart, what questions it's answered, what needs it's supplied. Lord, I just pray that everyone will go forth from this room tonight with a humble, I can't believe it's true, but I know it is, assurance that their life is secure in Jesus Christ and that from now on they can live and face whatever life throws at them knowing that they are saved, that they are secure in you. I thank you for giving us this assurance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.